Hey guys, so this is editing Irene here. I just wanted to step in and say that this week's episode was originally just me practicing what I was wanting to say during today's episode because the topic was a lot heavier and therefore I just wanted to like practice the points that I wanted to make and do like a test run, if you will, first with the mics and cameras on because you know, I still mask to a certain extent. And so what you guys see when I'm speaking on video on camera is a certain aspect of myself that is not completely like it. I haven't fully learned how to like let go in that aspect. And so because I'm always masking a little bit in my videos, sometimes when I'm talking about more complex, nuanced topics, I cannot formulate my thoughts as well and, and talk as smoothly so I just wanted to do like a test run where I just spoke whatever was on my mind hit all the points that I wanted to hit so that when I do go on camera like the next week it would flow a lot smoother that was what I was hoping but after a week passed I thought to myself I actually liked what I talked about on that test run. I felt like I spoke about everything I wanted to speak about in a very smooth way. And so I just thought to myself, like, why don't I just edit that video and upload that for this week's episode? And I don't need to go through all the trouble of refilming it. But that being said, I'm sure most people won't really notice, but I am not masking as much. I feel like you guys are going to see a part of me that is more authentic to like how I like to think and speak on my own. As you could probably see, I'm not making as much eye contact during this week's episode because when I am really thinking about my thoughts and in deep thought in general, I, I do not have the propensity to mask as effectively. So therefore I can't really look at the camera. I can't really sit still. I feel like I probably fidget a lot and I'm like looking in all these different directions because that helps me think better. I was really, really casual for the video as, as well because I wasn't planning on uploading it. And so like my hair is tied up in these crazy clips. You know, I told myself like I was just gonna have fun. It was gonna be casual and I was just gonna free flow speak on this topic and let my thoughts flow as freely as possible, get everything out there because a lot of the times what tends to happen is like if I were to have filmed the final cut the next week and spoke on the same topic, I probably would have like subconsciously edited everything I wanted to speak on down to a certain extent because I am not able to get my thoughts out as fluently when I'm masking. So you'll kind of see that my speech patterns and my thought patterns for this week's episode is probably a lot more freeform and flowy than it normally is, which works for what I wanted to speak on anyways. So yeah, that being said, I hope you guys enjoy this week's episode. Of course, the topic I'm speaking on is going to be a little bit harder to listen to for some people, maybe even triggering. So listen with caution. If you ever need to take a break, feel free to take a break and just check in with yourself to see if you're okay. If you start to feel anxious or triggered in any capacity, you know, don't force yourself to keep listening. But I do think this topic is very important to speak on and open a dialogue on as well. I hope you guys learn something and find some resonance in this video and find it at least interesting. But yeah, let's get into this week's episode. Enjoy. Okay, pen and paper in case I gotta write notes. My phone's here, AirPods here, iPad there and coffee here this is casual irene hey guys this is a test run for the bad vegan sarma episode where i will be doing a deep dive on how autistic individuals function in narcissistically abusive relationships when I first thought about like what I wanted this title to be, I thought are autistic people more prone to end up in an abusive relationship, but I really didn't feel comfortable framing it in that light because I strongly believe anyone can end up 
in an abusive relationship because ultimately it is not the victim's fault. So therefore we shouldn't frame it in a sense where we make it seem like there are things you can and can't do to prevent you from ending up in an abusive relationship. You know, saying that someone or a group of people are more prone to being in an abusive relationship says that there are characteristics of this person or a group of people that makes it so that they're more easily abused and therefore end up in abusive relationships, which is something I just do not think is true because we're ultimately taking the fault away from the abuser and placing it on the victim and saying that they had some sort of play into being in that abusive dynamic. But ultimately what I'm more comfortable with talking about is what an autistic person can look like and how they function within an abusive dynamic, within an abusive relationship. I also thought that this would be a very interesting topic to talk about coinciding with the documentary Bad Vegan specifically Sarma because there's a lot of like speculation that Sarma could be autistic or at least has autistic traits and when I say that I really want to put a disclaimer there and clarify that I am not diagnosing or saying that Sarma is autistic. No one on the internet has that power to diagnose and tell someone what they may or may not have over the internet because ultimately we're only seeing one side of them. We're not seeing the spectrum and we don't know who they are in many aspects of their life. So when I go into today's topic, I want to respect Sarma, respect the fact that she doesn't outwardly say she has autism or speculate it at all. And we could just leave it at that. But I do think this is a really interesting jumping off point when it comes to this specific conversation and deep dive that I'm doing today, because I know for a fact that I'm not the only one who, when I was first watching Bad Vegan, within like the first episode, I was already identifying so many autistic traits. And I think I'll go into some of that as well. And that is also like to say that a lot of autistic traits are not only specific to autism. Like a lot of our traits are things that we could share with so many other types of people outside of autism. It's just kind of like what defines autism is when you have all of these traits together coexisting with each other like for example anyone could have social anxiety anyone could be socially awkward anyone could miss social cues but does that issue also coincide with like sensory issues does it coincide with like other autistic traits and have you had these traits consistently since birth throughout your whole life but i think it's interesting to be able to talk about some of sarma's autistic traits that i saw i also searched it up online just because i was curious to see if anyone else was seeing what I was seeing and I saw like a reddit post of someone very respectfully asking whether or not other people saw or thought that she may be autistic. I read through the thread and I actually really resonated with a lot of the things they were saying and agreed with a lot of their points and I think they did in a very respectful way. I think speculating is healthy to an extent. I think if we speculate with respect for another person and without projecting onto the other person what we think as if it was a truth, it is ultimately healthy. I think a good way to speculate is to do it with one, with respect and two, knowing that you are not the all-knowing person and you are not the decider of anything the other person is ultimately they're gonna know themselves the best speculate knowing that you are looking and observing them from an outsider's perspective so therefore whatever speculation that you may have or conclusions you may come to is just based off of your own observations and your own subjective opinions that's it you know, it's that simple. And I think another way to think about that is like, it's more so about you and what you think and what you want to reflect on. It's more so about that than the other person themselves. They're just kind of like a jumping off point for your thoughts. When it comes to having a guideline as to what concept you're wanting to explore. Okay, so 
Some of the ASD traits I saw in Sarma immediately was the flat affect. Another trait was like unusual relationships. For example, the obvious one is like her relationship with her abuser is extremely unusual, especially from like outsider's perspective, like the people around her, her employees, also like us as the viewer, like we would see that and think that is extremely unusual and not normal. But for her being in it, yes, she probably questioned a lot of things throughout that relationship but like it had to have been normal or have had to make sense to her to a certain extent for her to have remained in it you know not to take away from the fact that abusive relationships are extremely manipulative but you have to at least to an extent resonate with the person and understand them to stick through so many red flags and another unusual relationship is her relationship with the homeless man. You know, by no means am I judging or saying it's bad, but it's something that someone would look at and just kind of be baffled at or at least question and wonder like, huh, it's not necessarily like normal. You wouldn't think such a beautiful, successful woman would just befriend a homeless man and that it was just this pure friendship because that is not something you typically see, right? And so their friendship is probably extremely pure and nothing more than that. But that's just something you don't see. And that's something I noted in my mind is that she just has like unusual relationships that you are not used to seeing. Another trait that I noticed that I feel like maybe other people didn't notice as much is very specific masking capabilities. I noticed that throughout different points in her life, for example, when she was like a teenager, she shaved her head and looked very alt. She literally present day looks completely different. Like she was platinum blonde, like beautiful. And if you were to like look at her as that, like the platinum blonde, beautiful vegan woman that was successful, you would think that she was a certain type of way. But if you actually listened to her and got to know her, you would see that she was not what she seemed like at all. She was very reserved. She was very disciplined. She was very shy, quiet, and introspective. I feel like this is a really good indication of autism because a lot of the times, especially for women, what we present on the outside, so like what we do to physically camouflage into society is not a direct representation of like who we are in actuality on the inside when it comes to like our moral values, our personality traits, stuff like that. And so for whatever reason that I'm not sure of because it wasn't revealed in the documentary, she had taken on this persona visually as like that beautiful blonde woman, but wasn't masking through her personality to go along with that visual because she probably learned that looking that way would mean a specific thing and would benefit her in specific ways, which just like if I were to speculate, you know, being beautiful, being blonde could get you really far in your career. You could be respected by high profile people. You could come across as more refined you could make connections with people who find you attractive or at least look up to you because of the way you look. Basically, you demand respect from others. And these are all things that has nothing to do with like who you actually are. It's just like a visual thing that makes it so that other people are ready to interact with you in a very specific way. And I feel like a lot of the times like autistic women rely on that format to make socializing easier and more predictable. We tailor our image to be in a very specific way because we know that in general our social interactions and our status in society will play out in a very specific way if we were to maintain that image and that kind of like goes along with her very reserved disciplined personality right she was very disciplined and reserved in her career and in general and that definitely translates to how calculated she is in particular she is about the way she looks 
and how it's very well maintained. She doesn't seem like the type of person that just like lets go and lets things randomly happen. Everything has an intention behind it, including the way she looks. And along that same point that I was making, a really good indication of like autism is that how you look visually has no connection whatsoever to who you actually are. So like, you know, when I just saw the poster of Bad Vegan, in the very beginning even, when they were showing all those magazine pictures of Sarma, I had this idea of like who she was going to be. And as we got to know her more and we heard her speak more, you began to quickly realize who she is has absolutely no connection and has nothing to do with who she looks like. I personally relate to this so much because I felt like for a lot of my adult life, when people would meet me, they had this very, very specific and clear idea of who I was going to be. And once people got to know me, they realized that I was nothing like how I looked. Before my diagnosis, I prided myself in this in a sense, because I liked the fact that I surprised people. I feel like from the surface, people would think that I am a superficial bimbo that cares about how I look. I don't have anything deep about me intellectually. I don't have any deep thoughts or reflections or I don't care about a lot of like deeper introspective things. But when they get to know me, there's just so many traits to me that is like outside of what people would think when they would look at other people that look like me. For example, I have a lot of tattoos and I noticed that for the longest time when I was dating as an adult, a lot of men thought that I would be a certain type of woman just based off of me having tattoos. Whenever I would hear people like think this way of me, I would be very baffled because that's not who I am at all. And I just don't know how people can draw those conclusions based off of like me having tattoos. But you know, that's kind of like part of autism especially with women, you learn how to mask visually, but you don't necessarily understand the nuances of what that means to everyone or why that means certain things to other people. Like Sarma could very much have gathered over her lifetime that if she were to be skinny, blonde, and beautiful, she would gain the respect of other people. She would gain connections. Other people would care more about her and what she had to say and what she had to do. And everyone was just very pleased with her. But she may have not known like why, if that makes sense. Like why would they all treat her this way just because of like her hair color and the way she looked. And there's like that very specific disconnect I feel like that happens with autistic individuals who do camouflage is like we learn how to like visually fit in and we know to an extent like what that means to people, but we don't really understand it, if that makes sense. Okay, so the fourth trait that really stood out to me was, it kind of coincides with the the camouflaging and that's the masking. I feel like this part is not really pointed out much as well, but I feel like a big reason why Sarma was so deep in the abuse at the end of the documentary and the reason why she didn't really seek help or talk to someone about it. Because near the end, the interviewer asked her multiple times, like, why couldn't you just ask people for help? Why couldn't you just talk to someone? Because she had so many people in her life that genuinely cared about her and was trying to help her. And to a normal person or from an outsider's perspective, they would think like, it's so obvious that she could have just said something to someone and have been helped to like come out of that abusive relationship. But when she was asked these questions again and again, she just very matter of fact said to the interviewer, like, what would I say? Like, what would I even say to and to whom would I have said that to? Like, what would they have even done? I genuinely believe her when she says that. And let me explain why. So I'm going to kind of like explain what it's like for an autistic individual to experience connecting to other people and therefore kind of like paint a picture as to how someone like Sarma could have been so deep in an abusive relationship, have people in her life that would have wanted to help and was ready to help but still not reach out for help. And that has to do with masking. If you're an autistic person, you learn that you cannot be who you actually are. 
because other people do not understand it and they actively shun it. And for your own safety and for your own survival, you learn throughout your lifetime that you have to basically create and refine multiple different masks and scripts with specific groups of people that you have to enact. And so what that means is, let's say Sarma is autistic. She has probably curated multiple different masks in how she interacts within those scripts and within that mask with multiple different people and different groups throughout her life. So like if I were to categorize this, imagine these as like pillars and they all are separate of each other and do not overlap at all. Like think about Inside Out and every person has their pillars. It's kind of like that for autistic people. Every time you go and interact with someone, you are interacting with them in the confines of that specific pillar. So there is Sarma when she's with her parents. There's Sarma when she's with her sister. There's Sarma when she's with her dog at home by herself. There's Sarma when she's around her employees. There's Sarma when she's with her homeless friend. And then there's Sarma when she's on TV and on magazines. And then there's Sarma when she's with her romantic partners. I'm not saying that when she's interacting with everyone, she's completely changing from one person to a whole other person. I'm not saying that. From an outsider's perspective, she could seem like a very consistent person and you can't even notice that there's masking going on. What I'm really defining this as is like how she's viewing that relationship. So she sees a certain relationship to be a certain way and have certain types of expectations, boundaries, and interactions. And so let's say she does not feel comfortable revealing very personal thoughts and emotions to her family, her employees, her friends, and to the press. But she feels comfortable being more vulnerable with her dog and her romantic partners. So in her mind, she knows that I do not overlap this boundary of hers because they're separate. Does that make sense? So this could be very debilitating for an autistic individual because it could be very, very tiring to keep up with like these very strict ideas of like what every relationship should be and how it should look like and how you could function in it. But I think once you've like refined to a certain extent who you're surrounded by and who you interact with, your life is more livable because ideally you are interacting with people that you genuinely like interacting with and so therefore even when you are switching in and out of all these different masks they're all still versions of yourself that is somewhat authentic i feel like it becomes debilitating when you are around people that require you to mask into a completely different person and it therefore becomes a lot less sustainable but judging from what it looked like sarma had pretty consistent groups of people that she could mask differently with, but they were all still authentic versions of herself. So how that relates to the abusive relationship is going back to the question when the interviewer kept asking her, why couldn't you just have reached out to your friends, your work partners, and even her family? Because they showed near the end that multiple people in her life were really worried about her and kept reaching out to her, even very directly saying that they are worried and want to help. And it was it was so obvious that she could have at least talked to one of those people, even if they weren't going to help her and didn't know how to help her, at least they would have known what was happening. But Sarma kept saying very matter-of-factly, what would I even have said? So what I got from that response of hers that she said multiple times is that wasn't even an option to her and she never even thought about it. Like it was a no-brainer. And I feel like a lot of normal people would look at that and just think to themselves, that doesn't make any sense. To me, and as someone who has experienced that, it made a lot of sense to me because to have asked for help to come out of the abusive relationship or to vent about your abusive relationship, there needs to have been a level of vulnerability, emotional connection and emotional vulnerability established 
to be able to talk about it. And most likely from her response, she didn't establish that with any of these people. And so it wouldn't have made sense for her to begin being that emotionally vulnerable person in such a conflicted situation, like a very intense situation. Because it wouldn't have made sense the relationship that she already established with these people. It would be going off script. And therefore, she wouldn't know how that interaction was going to go, therefore making her feel uncomfortable, therefore making her feel like, would this even help? You're also conscious of the other person. If I were to open up to them about this abusive relationship, how would they react to me? Because th this is not the person that they know. The person that they know wouldn't have talked about something emotionally vulnerable. The person that they know wouldn't have been in an abusive relationship in the first place. And so like, you're on another level, afraid that they are just going to be completely confused and thrown off and baffled, which could scare you because you feel like you might be invalidated and not understood. And so all of these circumstances and thoughts coinciding with each other makes it so that it's just not even an option to basically like come out of that pillar and have another mask bleed into this specific pillar. It just like didn't make sense. For her mind, she probably thought to herself, if this issue is stemming from my relationship, my romantic relationship, I need to fix it within that relationship. And that wasn't happening because she's with an abusive person. There's nothing to fix with them. They just keep taking from you. And so I feel like that's a big reason why she didn't ask for help. And another topic I wanted to talk about is her abuser had a lot of really crazy, nonsensical ideologies that from an outsider's perspective, you would hear that and think to yourself, how how did she believe that and how did she fall for it? To be specific, he talked a lot about, I don't know, I don't wanna speculate. You know, I don't wanna like say what he has or doesn't have, but let's say he does have bipolar or BPD or whatever. He had a lot of ideas that I feel like he genuinely believed. Like he, I don't think he made these stories up to just trick her. I feel like he genuinely believed it himself. But he believed in a lot of crazy ideologies of like non-human beings watching them and like somehow they're in danger. That implies that they're in danger or they had to do certain things because they would be punished or killed if they didn't follow through. I feel like if any normal person would hear someone say that, they would just be like, oh, this person's crazy. I am not gonna deal with it. Like I'm gonna leave, like that's a red flag. But it seemed like Sarma to an extent, believed in a lot of those things. If anything, she enabled it. You know, that doesn't have to mean she believes in it, but she at least didn't object it, if that makes sense. Part of that is the abuse, yes. When you spend a long, long enough time with an abuser and they have already tapped into a lot of your resources, it's hard to come out of their ideology and to have logical thinking because you just are, at that point, you are a victim to intense brain fog and cognitive dissonance. But I feel like how autism may play in that is if you think about it, like if you don't understand social normities already, your own concept of what is normal is not at the same baseline as like holistic people. And so it doesn't mean that you just believe in crazy things. But what I'm trying to say is that what you are open to might be at a higher threshold than an holistic person because you are trained throughout your life to accept things that already don't make sense. But you see that other people openly understand and accept it. And so therefore you learn to follow along these social normities, even if they don't make sense. And you, for the most part, get a good reaction from society and from others and you're safe. And if anything, you succeed as well. And so you are taught like, oh, this doesn't make sense. But if I follow through, I will be safe, I will be successful, and I will have people around me that love me and accept me. Now, if you apply that same action and logic to an abusive relationship, now you have an abuser who's telling you things that don't make sense to you and you don't necessarily agree with but you kind of just follow through with it anyways because you believe this person loves you and you love them and that is kind of what you're used to doing anyways and i feel like that is like a big reason why she kind of like went along with it and the reason why i think this 
And this adds to the reason why I think Sarma may be autistic is because throughout the documentary, I do not think she was completely like brainwashed. I do not think she completely was resonating with the fact that he had all these crazy ideologies of like non-human, demonic things. I don't think she herself believed in it because throughout the documentary and through the phone calls they were showing, she seemed very skeptical and she seemed very grounded in her own logic, which was was very confusing to me when I first watched it because I thought to myself, how could she have been victim if she seemingly was very skeptical of everything he believed in? Like you would think that if he was saying like the demons are going to come get you if you don't do this. And she was like, you know, that doesn't make sense. Why should I do that? You would think that she would be able to like not listen to him or leave the relationship, right? But I feel like that's where the autism may come into play, where it doesn't make sense to you, but you just do it anyways because you do that in so many other aspects of your life. And so I feel like it's harder in a sense for an autistic individual once they are in an abusive relationship to begin to see what is normal and what isn't normal because everything just kind of doesn't make sense anyways in an holistic world and when you are having relationships with holistic people and so a coworker who is opening up to you about emotional deep things might make you feel the same amount of weirdness than your romantic partner saying demons are watching over us and they're going to come get us if we don't listen to them you know it's like to an holistic person they would be able to clearly define that one is normal and one isn't but for you as an autistic person like they're both weird does that make sense like it just makes it harder for you to define what isn't normal and therefore you have to leave and therefore you feel unsafe stuff like that so the next thing I noticed they kind of go into the abuser and his previous victim which was his ex-wife it seemed like he just up and left her out of nowhere and that in comparison with like his relationship with Sarma, it seemed like he latched onto Sarma and was with her for a longer time. And so that made me think about why was he so quick to leave his previous victim? Why was he holding onto Sarma and the relationship with her for dear life? And this also ties into the autism as well. Again, I am speculating. This is my opinion. It's not truth. This is just what I think. I feel like her abuser was a narcissist. And when we're talking about narcissistic people, the most important thing to them is what they can get out of others. So resources is the most important thing. Resources, validation, stuff like that. Oftentimes, narcissistic abusers will hop from one relationship to another and the thing that they're looking for is one how easily manipulated is this person two how much can i get out of them those two factors will determine how much they're willing to abuse you and keep you around because they're ultimately weighing out how much you benefit them, how useful you are to them. And it seemed like his ex-wife didn't have much resource to give him. He was unemployed. I don't think she was employed either. So if you think about it, they didn't have like finances. They didn't have like luxury. She wasn't like, some famous person, you know, she was just a normal woman wanting a normal loving relationship and a normal family. And that is not much resource for him to leech off of. But Sarma on the other hand was a beautiful woman. She was successful, had her own business she was on TV. She objectively had more for him to take away. And I think that's why ultimately he stayed with her longer is because he was consistently draining her of all the resources, taking her money, taking her status, uh, using that to gamble, using that to spend money on expensive things so he could look high status, stuff like that. Leeching off of her resources as well, wanting to basically take away her business from her, take away the money her business was making making, take away her connection, stuff like that. That is what a narcissist does. Like she is literally the epitome of the perfect narcissistic fuel. And how autism plays into that is when you get an autistic individual that is self-sufficient, it's game over when they meet a narcissist. Because if you think about it, if Sarma was an autistic individual, she has built a bunch of relationships with people that she isn't necessarily like emotionally dependent on them. She has over time built up her resilience when it comes to being an independent person. She probably learned to 
to emotionally regulate all on her own. And so therefore she doesn't emotionally open up to or depend on other people to help her process and carry her emotional weight. And so one, that is perfect for the narcissistic abuser because he doesn't have to emotionally regulate her because she does it on her own. Two, because she's so good at emotionally regulating herself, every time he drains her of her physical resources, financial resources, or her emotional resources, she could then go off on her own and replenish her energy reserves. And so therefore she's good to go the next time he wants to take away from her. So if you think about it, she's like, a wall plug and she just recharges over and over again on her own and he just like comes in whenever he wants plugs himself into her and just takes all that energy out and goes off and uses it for himself and then she recharges and he comes back and that cycle goes on again and again and again i feel like normal people who doesn't have that very specific resilience and independence that an autistic individual has needs to have generally equal energy exchanges with with everyone in their life and everything like they charge other people up but they also need other people and other things to charge themselves you're constantly plugging into other people they're plugging into you it's like an equal exchange but for an autistic person it's like you are constantly giving your energy to others not requiring their energy to replenish yourself but you just go off on your own and recharge on your own and then you go out and you give your energy to others and that's the cycle that you are used to having and i think that's why she was so attached to her dog because most likely her dog was the only other thing that she was openly allowing to help charge her and I think that's why her dog is so important to her because in that sense that was the only thing probably that is the only thing that she can emotionally depend on and that actually charges her emotions back up. And so, yeah, in a sense, being an autistic person makes you extremely independent and effective as an adult if you do learn how to function in that specific way. And it's not a good or bad trait. Yes, it could have its mental health effects because you could feel lonely. You could sometimes feel like there's no one out there that will understand you and be there for you but for the most part if you find a good balance as to like basically getting your needs met even though it's different from other people you could have a sustainable life and it seemed like Sarma was able to have a sustainable life and she had like a very specific formula to her life and so what happens is when you are in a relationship with a narcissistic abuser they take advantage of that they take advantage of the fact that you are such an independent person Person and that you have so much resource that you are so self-sufficient and recharge yourself and that you don't depend on others. For him, it's perfect because he drains her resources. He doesn't need to maintain her whatsoever or take care of her, but also it's easier to isolate her and to continue to manipulate her and drain her because she is not depending on other people and therefore they're not there to give her input or to help her out of the situation. Which kind of leads into my next topic, and that is how this all started to unravel. I genuinely believe if other people wasn't starting to be affected negatively by her abuser, Sarma would have ended up in that relationship for longer. Maybe she wouldn't have even gotten out of that relationship because she is so self-sufficient. And I think this is kind of the danger of an autistic individual that meets all of these specific standards and being in a narcissistically abusive relationship is she was probably suffering so much but she is so strong that she probably could have kept going and going and going and found a way to keep making it work. And I feel like the only reason why she was able to get out of it at the time that she did was because other people were being negatively affected. He was taking money from multiple people. And so she was kind of forced or other people were forced to come intervene into the relationship. Either way, there was like some intervention that happened, even though it wasn't directly like people wanted to intervene because they knew she was in an abusive relationship and they wanted to help her there was an intervention in a sense where people were being negatively affected so they're like something's wrong here and we need there to be something done about it and that's kind of what that last straw that broke the camel's back as they say which is kind of like the danger of like I said an autistic person being in a narcissistically abusive relationship is I feel like their threshold to persevere through the abuse is very high but also they have more resources 
resources for the person to tap into. And it's easier for the person to drain those resources and manipulate you and isolate you. I feel like that's kind of like the conclusion I wanted to make to wrap up this video is my intention with this deep dive is to kind of like analyze what autistic traits may look like within a narcissistically abusive relationship and how an autistic person can function within an abusive relationship, not to put the blame on the victim, but to just bring awareness to it and to explore how an autistic person can be victimized by a narcissist compared to an holistic person and how that dynamic may be different from an holistic person. Just because I, I feel like it's going to be easier for autistic women, autistic victims in general to be able to identify for themselves if they are in a narcissistically abusive relationship right now or if they were or if they might find themselves in one in the future. I feel like this video might be helpful because I hopefully have, you know, explored and deep dived on very specific traits and how they play out to an extent that makes sense to you guys so that when you find or found yourself in these dynamics, it could be more quickly identified by you and therefore you can understand that this is not a safe situation. It's not normal and therefore please like do what you need to get yourself out safely. I also wanted to reflect a little bit on, you know, I personally related a lot to Sarma and her experience. Obviously, the extent of the abuse I experienced with my narcissistic abuser was not the same as hers. The way I like to explain it is like the flavor is the same, but the food is different. So different ways of abuse, but the same results, if that makes sense. I feel like part of the reason why I was such a good victim to my previous abuser was because I was already isolated in a sense. Like I was isolated because I didn't have many people in my life at the time. And the few people I did have in my life were people that I didn't necessarily feel comfortable opening up to. And on top of it, I had very specific masks when I interacted with them. So if I were to just like open up to them about the abuse I was experiencing and cry and all that stuff, it would just not be who they expect me to be and that just wasn't the interaction that I was used to having with them and there were like very few times I opened up to one of my best friends at the time every now and then about the abuse I was experiencing but that person I'm not friends with them anymore but that best friend of mine at the time just like didn't do anything about it so it's like even when you do cross that barrier and you do take off that mask maybe that person doesn't even know how to help you maybe that person doesn't even believe you at that point. My best friend that I opened up to didn't believe me. They thought that it was just normal issues that people have within relationships and that I was just being emotional, stuff like that, because they're so used to me being so self-sufficient and strong and independent, you know? So it's like there's so many factors of being an autistic person that plays into narcissistically abusive dynamics. And I think it's so important for us to talk about that, you know? Obviously, I wish my friend at that time would have believed me, but at the same time, like if I were to analyze everything from a bird's eye view, I can understand why they didn't believe me because one, they're not educated. Two, you wouldn't think that a strong independent person could be abused or be in an abusive dynamic, right? Three, it's normal for people to cry about relationships every now and then and vent about it. And so like, I understand that my friend at the time probably saw that and was like, oh, this is normal. She's just sad about something that happened between her and her boyfriend. But little did he know, like I was in an abusive dynamic and I was actually crying out for help in some sort of capacity from him. And he didn't give me that help and he didn't intervene. And so I know a lot of my viewers on here have experienced an abusive relationship and a narcissistically abusive relationship. For the sake of today's topic, if you are that person and you are also autistic, I just want to say if you are in one right now, I hope this video has opened your eyes and taught you something. I hope it helps you either get out of your relationship as soon as you can and as safely as you can. If you find yourself in an abusive dynamic or with a narcissist in the future, I hope you can identify it quicker and I hope that you know to just leave as soon as you can because you just don't want to give them time to like get their fangs into you 
to drain you, it's not your fault. It's it's always the abuser's fault. They're the ones that need help. They're the ones that need to have enough self-awareness to know that they hurt others and they need to work on that. But all we can do is educate ourselves and have enough self-awareness to know how we function in our lives and in our relationships, what narcissistic relationships and dynamics look like, what a narcissist looks like, what an abuser looks like, and how we tend to function within that dynamic so that you can identify it faster and leave faster. But yeah, today's topic was very, very interesting. I've been wanting to talk about it for a while just because I feel like it's something that I didn't see online. And so open a dialogue in the comment section below. I myself really, really crave to hear what others have to say about today's topic because I feel like I can't really talk about it to the extent I wanted to with other people, which is a common experience I have as well. Yeah, if this video wasn't interesting, I hope it was at least helpful. Again, I just want to respect Sarma and say again, I am not diagnosing her. I'm not saying she has autism. I'm just using her as a jumping off point for this topic. I hope that she is healing and doing what she needs to do to continue to heal. And I hope she knows that she didn't deserve what happened to her. Not that she will ever, ever watch this video. Give this video a like. It helps me out a lot. And subscribe to my channel. I make a new video every week. Thank you guys for listening this far on my deep dive. I've been trying to keep my videos a little shorter because our attention spans are probably not that long. We don't have that much time in our days. But I felt like today's topic was something I couldn't just quickly summarize in these quick talking points. I felt like it deserved more in-depth reflections. And so today's episode is longer and more introspective than usual. But I feel like I enjoy balances like this. For the most part, I'll probably keep my videos around 20 to 30 minutes. But every now and then, if I find a topic super, super interesting on, I'll probably deep dive into it. Like today's episode and these episodes are probably going to be like an hour long. But yeah, hope you guys are enjoying your day and I will see you guys on next week's video. Bye.